Ava is a visual arts center located on the campus of the University of Alabama at Birmingham. We present eight to 10 exhibitions a year, highlighting a mix of regionally, nationally, and internationally acclaimed artists, focused almost exclusively on contemporary art. We serve a diverse audience of university faculty, staff, and students, artists, museum patrons, and donors. We help represent the visual arts at UAB to local and regional institutions, but also the national and international art community. But most importantly, we continuously strive to keep our exhibitions directly relevant and engaging to our surrounding Birmingham communities. And all of our exhibitions and supporting educational programming like this one tonight is free and open to the public. Um, I'm sure everyone in the room and most of the people at home are aware that we are ultimately here tonight because of this tremendous exhibition currently on display in our galleries, uh, marking time in the age art in the age of mass incarceration. Um, this exhibition is curated by Dr. Nicole R. Fleetwood, the James Weldon Johnson Professor of Media, Culture and Communication at NYU and reflects her decade long commitment to research and programming on the visual art and culture of mass incarceration. We are thankful for her and the entire National Marking Time team for working with us on bringing this exhibit to Birmingham. Those of you who are in attendance this evening, um, we'll get the opportunity after the panel to walk across the street with us to Ava to view the exhibition. And for those of you who are at home, if you'd like to see the exhibition in person, you can book a free viewing on our website. And when I get done with the introductions here, I'll pop the Ava website into the chat. Um, let's see here. I will now introduce our moderator for tonight, who has been a friend to Ava for several years now, primarily through our partnership with the Jefferson County Memorial Project. She is a bona fide Birmingham treasure, and I'm always honored to be in her presence. T. Marie King is an activist, speaker, trainer, and community consultant with nearly 20 years of service, education, and community experience. She travels to cities across the nation, serving as an authentic voice for progressive change. She consults with community-based and national organizations on diversity issues, effective efforts, and community healing and conversations. King has worked with the National Network for Safe Communities, Yale Divinity School, the Barr Foundation, and the Alabama State Council on the Arts, to name a few. King is a trained truth, racial healing, and transformation facilitator through the W.K. Kellogg Foundation, a trained empathetic facilitator through Create Forward, and a faculty member with the Satyaga Raha Institute. She holds a BA in Urban and Global Economic Development and an MA in Leadership and Divinity. Recently, King joined the leadership team of Jones Valley Teaching Farm as Director of Youth Pathways and Experiences. King continues to carry out her mission by creating pathways to communal healing by teaching change through an empathetic lens to build a better global community. T. Marie King, everyone. Thank you, John. Good evening, everyone. And so thank you so much for joining us this evening at Ava for this panel, State of Alabama Prisons, Past and Present. I'm your moderator, T. Marie King. State of Alabama Prisons was created to support Marking Time, an exhibition currently at Ava, curated by Dr. Nicole Fleetwood, please see Ava's website, uab.edu slash avamarkingtimeart.com for information about upcoming programs and events. Tonight, we have a great panel of esteemed guests who hold an array of experience and expertise in criminal justice reform advocacy, history, law, media, policy, and as well as a personal experience in the penal system. We hope to have a productive and informative conversation as well as leaving time for Q&A. So let me introduce our panel to you today. We have Carla Crowder. She's the executive director of Alabama Appleseed, a nonprofit law center, a native Alabamian, three decades of experience in criminal justice reform as a journalist and an attorney. She has represented dozens of incarcerated Alabamians and recently won release for six men originally sentenced to die in prison. Carla joined Alabama Appleseed in 2019 and directs the organization's policy advocacy agenda centered at the intersection of poverty and the criminal justice system. Next, we have Dr. Catherine Morgan. She's a professor of criminal justice and director of the African-American studies program at UAB. She was awarded degrees in sociology, criminology from Texas and Florida State University. 
Dr. Morgan's research and teaching areas include race, crime, and social policy, gender issues and criminal justice, and correctional practices and policies. Her research has been published in Journal of Criminal Justice, Justice Quarterly, Criminology and Public Policy, Criminal Justice Policy Review, and Criminal Justice Review. Her book, Probation, Parole, and Community Corrections in Theory and Practice, first edition, was published in 2015. The second edition of her book is forthcoming. Next, we have Beth Shelbourne, a journalist and writer based in Alabama. Her words have been published in the Los Angeles Times, The Bitter Southerner, The Daily Beast, and Beyond Words Literary Journal. She was a 2019 writer for Justice Fellow with PEN America and currently works as an investigative reporter with ACLU of Alabama. Beth has a MA in creative writing from the University of Alabama at Birmingham and a BA in journalism from Auburn University. And one of my favorite panelists tonight, <laughs> Mr. Ron McKeithen. He is a formerly incarcerated artist, advocate, and writer. He spent 37 years in Alabama's prisons under the state's Habitual Felony Offender Act based on a robbery conviction at the age of 20. He used his time in prison to increase his education, become a barber, a mentor to others, and create many meaningful connections with professors, journalists, and volunteers in the, prison, in the prisons. He was freed in December 2020 after being represented by Alabama Appleseed. He lives in Birmingham where he works with both where he works both at Alabama Appleseed and at a drug treatment center. Please welcome our panelists. Awesome, so we're gonna just jump on into the conversation. So Carla, I'm gonna start with you. How did you become interested in criminal justice reform? So I wanna start just by thanking Ava, Dr. Fleetwood and everyone that was involved in bringing this incredible exhibit to Birmingham. Um, none of this would have happened without your collaborative efforts. And thank you for inviting us to this stage. Um, I actually began not as an activist or a lawyer, but as a journalist. Um, I was a journalist with a front row seat on um, crime and criminal justice issues in the 1990s. So I'm old, um, but that was a time when the country was making really bad decisions. Um, kind of the height of the war on drugs, uh, the tough on crime era. Um, and I started as a reporter covering crime. I would just tell stories from neighborhoods where crime happened, where there was gang activity. Um, you know, I would cover drug bust where police would go in with armored vehicles and um, you know, shake down neighborhoods. And I wrote a lot of stories that landed on the front page. They were quite sensational. And I was ultimately incredibly dissatisfied with the work that I was doing. Um, I began asking questions of people in power. So systems in power, police and prosecutors and lawmakers, um, because ultimately it was those systems, government systems, elected officials that had a lot of control over what was happening in people's lives and neighborhoods. And as a journalist, I felt like it was my responsibility not to just tell the stories of the most vulnerable people among us on the worst day of their lives, but to figure out what else was going on that was harming communities. So I bring, I guess, a lens of government accountability and challenging abuses of power. Um, at the time, it was kind of that the heyday, I feel like, of, of newspapers. And I was encouraged to really um, ask tough questions. I was 21, 22 years old and I was really difficult and aggressive to deal with. I would march into police chief's offices and the district attorney's offices and, and really ask difficult questions. But ultimately after you know, several years of covering crime, I began looking much more deeply at these systems in place um, that are fueled by our tax dollars and part of our democracy. So the foster care system, the prison system, the juvenile justice system, and realizing that these systems were being politicized to keep people in power and that the politics of fear and punishment um, was driving policies that just didn't make sense. And I feel like mass incarceration is sort of the ultimate example of this. 
The United States has 5% of the world's population, 25% of the world's incarcerated people. So if incarceration worked to stop violence, to keep us safer, we would be the safest system, safest country in all of civilization. And clearly that's not the case. So ultimately I realized that stories of individual mistakes, crime offenses were really unsatisfactory. Um, and stories of government and system accountability were, were what I wanted to tell. Um, and when I started telling those stories, I realized um, often, you know, as a journalist, we're supposed to be unbiased. We're supposed to tell both sides. And when there is a case of a wrongful conviction or an excessive sentence or a prison that is being mismanaged and people are being hurt and are dying, there aren't two sides to that story. Um, and I, I just realized I couldn't stand on the sidelines and attempt to tell both sides anymore. And so I left journalism after 16 years um, and I went to law school um, and it was, a, it was the right decision for sure. Um, but I, I want us to kind of think about mass incarceration, particularly prisons in Alabama that have now been declared unconstitutional by the Department of Justice because of you know, enormous violence, um, assaults, excessive force by officers, corruption, contraband brought in by officers, kind of through this lens of government accountability. Um, and, and I think one of the, the primary examples of how um, ultimately like secretive and broken these systems are is the state of Alabama has doubled its Department of Corrections budget in the last 10 years. So we now spend about 25% of the state's general fund, $570 million a year on a prison system that has been declared dysfunctional and unconstitutional um, by the United States Department of Justice. Our legislature just passed legislation to build two new massive prisons and give that broken system $1.3 billion for new prisons. Um, so that fight is what keeps me up at night, um, what continues to motivate my work um, and hopefully will interest many of you all here and watching from home. Thank you, Carla. Thank you for not only your perspective and lens but also for sharing why we all should be concerned about what's, what's happening with the correctional system. Um, so Dr. K, I'm gonna go to you next. Can you offer us a historical perspective of the Alabama prison system, but also what are the foundations and what has it evolved into today? So typically I'm interested in community corrections as you could see from my bio. And I took some time off from academia to work in probation in Texas because I wanted to see, you know, get a taste of the real world. Uh, I got interested in the prison system here in Alabama because I was looking at data, um, working with the research and planning uh, director uh, some years ago, and we were trying to develop a coalition between the academic department at UAB and the Department of Corrections Research and Planning Division. So I started to look at you know, the prison system, started to look back at the prison system. What was interesting is historically, um, Alabama did not have a prison system from 1819 to 1841. There was no prison system. It was in 1841 that the Wetumpka Penitentiary opened and they took their first client, the first inmate entered in 1842. Now Alabama has 13 uh, correctional facilities, major correctional facilities, and 14 uh, community correctional facilities. Um, one of the things that has interested me historically is to look at how the Alabama prison system, as with many other states, perpetuated slavery. Uh, I'm sure you're familiar with Douglas Blackman's book, uh, Slavery by Another Name, The Reenslavement of African Americans you know, in the period from the Civil War to World War II. And he talks about the myriad, the plethora of ways and techniques that African-Americans, although free, were re-enslaved. In many states, they use black codes. And black codes were simply laws that were passed to maintain, you know, the sub subjugation, the subordination of freed African-Americans. And so Alabama kind of stayed away from the black codes because they looked at some of the difficulties of some of the other states. And so, but they passed very strict vagrancy laws. 
And these vagrancy laws said that if you didn't have a job, if you could not show proof of employment, then you were subject to be arrested for vagrancy. And so even though unemployment rates were high, uh, white males were also unemployed, black males were arrested and then could not pay fees. There were a number of fees that were charged, uh, fees to the chair, fees to the arresting officer, fees to the court that they could not pay. So they were sentenced to prison and sentenced to hard labor. And we are all familiar with the convict leasing system. Uh, when I look at, um, we, we are familiar with, historically, we're familiar with the uh, chain gang here in Alabama. One of the things I've looked at and one of the things interested me are some of the things going on, you know, currently with our system. I've looked at healthcare for women and looking at the disparity between uh, facilities for men and for women. There's one facility for women here, Tudweiler. So I've looked at that. I've looked at healthcare and looked at the kind of health care that women get versus the kind of health care that's available for men in men's facilities. But I've also looked at expenditures. And she mentioned that Alabama spends a lot of money on prison cost. And I looked at uh, probably the first, uh, most recent numbers, like $595 million, you know, spent on corrections. And so what's interesting about that is very little of that money goes to uh, inmate care or inmate per year or per inmate spending. Alabama spends roughly between 14 and $15,000 on inmates per year. And that's the lowest in the country. That, that is the lowest. Um, when I was working with the Department of Corrections in the 90s, uh, it was about $8,000, you know, and the director said, we don't spend much on inmates here. It went up to 10. And so in the 90s, and now it's 2019, and that spending still has not increased. That is, that is concerning. Uh, also looking at data, uh, Alabama has, uh, in terms of per capita deaths due to COVID, Alabama ranks fourth in the nation. You know, even though Alabama is not, not you know, that large and the prison system, you know, consists primarily uh, you know, 27,000, 2019, but per capita deaths of COVID, you know, in Alabama prisons, you know, Alabama ranks number four. Uh, I also look at incarceration rates. Uh, Alabama at one time had high, high incarceration rates. Um, looking at, in, they've gone down, I think the Vera Institute in 2015, you know, put incarceration rates at 946 per 100,000 population members, which said that for every 100,000 people in Alabama, you know, there are 946 people incarcerated. Now the numbers have gone down. In 2018, it was 432, and 2019 data indicated 419 per 100,000 population. So the numbers are going down, but still too many, uh, still too many. And when you look at race, when you look at those numbers and you look at those rates by race, it's still concerning. Uh, when you look at, for example, African-Americans make up 28% of Alabama's population, but when you look at the numbers, of people incarcerated per 100,000 population, 1,417 compared to whites, 425 per 100,000 population. Um, overcrowding violence is, I mean, as she mentioned, you know, violence is a major problem. Uh, violence as a result, a lot of, a lot of prison to prisoner uh, violence occurring in the system. Um, not as much reported uh, inmate uh, to, guard, correctional officer, but certainly a lot of prison, prisoner to prisoner violence. And so really concerning uh, issue, overcrowding contributes to that, overcrowding, uh, there was a prison economy that contributes to that. Uh, and so there are many, many issues uh, that contribute to that. And so I'll talk a little bit more about the parole release system because it's very different in Alabama than it is in other states. I'll talk a little bit also about what I discovered in my study of healthcare for women uh, in the state of Alabama, in Alabama prisons. Thank you, Dr. K. So Ron, I'm gonna come to you next. How do persistent problems of violence impact the safety and rehabilitation among the incarcerated? And can you share a story from your experience? Uh, I can share many stories, uh, all of them horrible, but these statistics, Staggering to me because I can, 
I can see it. It's true. Everything she said is true. Um, what shamed me to say that I've seen violence so much that it became an inconvenience to a lot of us because it was just a way of life. You know, it wasn't nothing to see somebody getting stabbed or see somebody walk up behind somebody, hit them with a lock in a sock or something like that. Um, there was occasion when I was sitting, it was in, in the dining hall. I was sitting at the table, about there was three other guys there. And a guy come behind this guy and stabbed him in the neck, like right there and the blood like skidded out into my food, you know? And to be honest with you, I was more mad about it being on my food than the guy getting stabbed. Because really, I didn't know this guy anything, but I'm talking about, it's, that's how it is. It gets like that. But, um, and I don't see nothing changing. Now, if we had more officers, I'm gonna be honest with you, we need, we need more officers. And the reason why they don't have any is because too many of them are getting fired for bringing in drugs or just quitting. They would, uh, a lot of the women come there, they're, well, sexually um, disrespected, not just by inmates, but also by officers. And it's a horrible place, but me, I've, I was blessed. I was only in one fight and it was on the basketball court. I've never owned a knife. And it's a lot of guys in there that have never owned a knife because we felt we didn't need it. But the majority of them feel they need a knife because if you don't have a knife, that's just like going to a gunfight with a toothpick or something, you know. And, and a lot of times they'll get these weapons because they need to protect themselves because the officers are not going to protect them. There are dorms out there with over 100 and, what, 126 guys in different dorms. There's supposed to be a, a, a cubicle up there where they officers supposed to watch you and make sure nothing happens. For the last, I don't know, maybe five, six years I was there, they stopped putting officers up there. So if a guy was getting chased with a knife or anything, and if he couldn't get to that door, which is locked, to holler out the window, if somebody else don't say, hey, this guy getting stabbed, well, how can you let the officer know what's going on that's way down there? And by the time the officer gets there and open the door, the deed is done. It's been so many occasions where an officer will open the door and there's a guy laying there where they jumped on. I was just talking to a guy where he had witnessed another guy knock this guy out. And he laying there on the ground and knock him out. An officer come out the dorm and just stepped over the guy and kept going. It's this drug called Flocker that's going on. And it was easy, to, it's, it's, it was like, Normally, see a guy just flocking out like he's having a seizure. You'll see guys, two guys together, sitting together, just flocked out. And the most shameful part about it is that guys are trying to numb the pain of being there. Guys are scared of being afraid every day for their life, you know, because I've, talk, I've had conversations with guys where they'll tell me someone just got killed or some, something just happened. But I can hear in their voice, like, the possibility of them, you know, they tell me, I can hear that fear in their voice because I know that feeling. Especially this guy, just we know this guy, this guy slept real close by. It gets to the point that you can't even sleep at night, you know, but it's horrible. And it's, the solution, the best solution I can come up with is to get better trained officers. Because right now they'll just put them in. And it was a time when an officer would have an officer, a counselor. Each officer was somewhat of a counselor because he's been trained to where he should have counseled situation or interact with guys instead of like now you just guys just. Officers just treating guys like dogs, you know, and waiting on opportunity for one to get it wrong or two or three others up and beat them up. But now there are a lot of good officers in there as well. But when you're a good officer and you with your, did your coworkers, you got to swing that stick too. Because if you don't swing that stick too, they're going to blackball you. They're going to make your days, they're real bad, you know. And um, I was lucky. I came out somewhat sane. But um, I know a lot of guys that went crazy because me doing 37 years, I got to study guys for a long time. And you can see the changes. You can see when they start to act unusual, getting on certain drugs or dealing with certain guys or doing just going off the temper to where they just want to go to lockup. They will like make guys fight them just so they can go to lockup because you just can't say, hey, I want to go to safe keeping for a while. No, I need to go to, I need to be by myself before I kill somebody or get killed. Um, that's about as much as I can share on that. I can go on and on about some horror stories, yeah. you know. Uh, for instance, this is something I just explained to this UAB class. It was crazy. First, somewhat violence I first saw in prison. I heard a commotion outside the door. When I opened my door, I'm on the top tier. 
um, it's a guy standing on the other side of the rail. He has a towel tied onto the, to the uh, rail. He has the other part of the towel tied around his neck. And he has some broke up razor blades in his hand. And he's officers down in and inmates, you know, they saw him saying, you know, jump, do it. He's saying he's going to put these in his mouth, you know, and swallow and jump. And I'm like, that was kind of ingenious. I'm like, you thought about that? Like, you want to like, and this, that was like, I couldn't comprehend that. It's for somebody to think to break up some razor blades, swallow them, and then jump. And I knew then I was in a madhouse, mm. you know? And that's what it is. It's a madhouse in there. Well, Ron, thank you for your vulnerability, mm -hmm. for sharing your story, and we are definitely glad that you're here to be with us. Mm -hmm. Beth, I'm going to ask you, as a reporter who has covered Alabama prisons, talk about why prison construction has never worked in terms of prison reform. Um, well, first of all, I'm really grateful that we're having this conversation. Um, I started covering Alabama prisons and have been writing about them and covering them in 2012. So I feel like I kind of picked up the baton when Carla left and went to, mm -hmm. um, to law school. But um, I talk to uh, folks in the system like Ron every day and their family members. And so I'm, I'm just really grateful that UAB is holding this space to have this vital conversation. Um, there's no really other way to describe what's going on in Alabama prisons than just an epic human rights catastrophe. And um, I've learned in covering this prison system that um, it's operated in perpetual crisis since its inception. This isn't a new problem. It's always been this way. Alabama has normalized this kind of environment. Like Ron said, mm -hmm. you become disaffected when you're incarcerated in this environment to systemic violence, daily violence, sexual violence, drugs, corruption, it's all there. Um, and it's, it's part of the drill. Dr. Morgan mentioned that our modern prison system was founded in 1842. Um, the very first person admitted into Alabama prisons was sentenced for harboring an escaped slave. So that sort of tells you what the foundation of this system was and is. Um, but I've, I've found that in talking to people like Ron um, and, and writing extensively about these problems and really trying to understand what is going on here? Like, why is it so bad here in Alabama? Why can we not fix this? Why do we have the most violent prison system in the country, in the world maybe? Why do we have the most homicides? We have the highest murder rate in an incarcerated setting in the nation. We have the highest suicide rate in the nation. Like, why is that? Are we just inherently more violent? No, I don't think that's it. I think that um, there's two things happening behind the crisis. It's a combination of policy failures so failures coming out of Montgomery and our criminal sentencing structure and administrative failures at the facility level. So the policies I'll talk about first, that is what causes over-incarceration. We have too many people in our prisons for far too long, period. That is the problem. That's always been the problem. It's the problem now, and it was the problem 10 years after we opened the walls at Wetumpka in 1842. We had too many people in there for far too long. Um, a good example is the Habitual Felony Offender Act. This is a failed policy. This is the policy that sent Ron McKeithen to prison to die for a single robbery with no physical injury and three property crimes. And he was sentenced to the worst possible criminal sentence next to death. Death in prison, death by incarceration is what I call it. Life without parole. It's throwing a person away. It's telling them that they cannot be redeemed, end of story, go to prison to die. And Ron was among hundreds of mostly men sent every year after this law was enacted in 1977, the dawn of the tough on crime era. 
And now over 6,000 people in our prison system are serving enhanced, enhanced sentences, which really just means bloated, draconian, ridiculously long sentences. There's no return on investment. It's not like we get a public safety benefit from that. There is no public safety benefit. There's no data to show that this makes us safer. It is purely punishment. It is pure vengeance to send people away for these sentences. And time and again, there has been a groundswell of family members, loved ones of people like Ron that will lobby legislators to please amend this law, please help my loved one. And it fails every time. They'll tinker around the edges, but the law needs to go. We are not in line with other states. This is the most punitive three strikes law in the nation and it needs to go. So that's just one policy failure that has contributed to too many people being in our prisons for far too long. I think that the administrative failures are some of the things Ron talked about. Um, we don't have enough officers because of the overcrowding and many of the problems that that causes. Good officers have left in droves. Many of our prisons are running at 35 to 40% of required authorized staff. They cannot retain staff. And this is, we've been operating this way forever. Our prisons have never been fully staffed, but the staffing crisis is really um, incredible and can't be understated. There's a culture of corruption. Ron mentioned officers getting fired for bringing in drugs. There is a robust drug trafficking trade in our prison system. And that is facilitated and supported by this agency. The people inside are incarcerated and locked up. They can't traffic in kilos of drugs that are moving throughout the prisons. That has to happen in collusion with staff. And because the Alabama Department of Corrections refuses to really acknowledge the scale and scope of this problem, it's, it's not getting fixed. They are making some arrests but what I hear from my sources is we are really um, picking off some low hanging fruit <laughs> and not getting to the root of the problem as far as the corruption goes. I think there's also been, and Ron can speak to this more than me, but a culture of indifference. We've never been rehabilitative. We've never been correctional. We call ourselves that, but the state has never invested in quality programming and educational opportunities, it's punishment. And so somebody like Ron, who did 37 years in prison and thought that he would never get out, he rehabilitated himself. It's up to individuals to work on themselves, take advantage of the very few opportunities that are there and you know, recover from whatever was going on when they went to prison on their own and in spite of their environment, not because of it. And so it's a testament to Ron and other people who make it out of there as better people, really to the, the strength of their character and um, their fortitude, that they're able to do that in such a horrifically violent and, and corrupt environment. Um, the last thing I'll say uh, in studying the system and what's going on in Alabama and asking the questions, why, why do we suck at this? Why can we not get better? Um, I, I see that throughout our prison system's history, we seem to cycle through sort of growing public awareness and outrage over the overcrowding, the violence, all the things that are going on inside the system, usually because of lawsuits. It's not usually something that we take the bull by the horns and start to investigate ourselves. Um, and by ourselves, I mean like lawmakers and people in power, it's usually prompted by lawsuits or a federal investigation. And Alabama's solution has always been to just build more prisons and it's never fixed the problems. This happened when we had 4,000 people in our prison system. And it happens when we have 24,000 people in our prison system. And, you know, it happened most recently in the seventies. That was the last time there was a big federal investigation system-wide of our prisons. We had far fewer people in prison and far fewer facilities. The federal government took over our prisons because we couldn't get with the program and bring them up to constitutional standards. 
And what was our solution? We built nine new prisons over the period of a decade and nothing changed inside. All we did was make our incarceration problems bigger and bigger and bigger. And so that's why construction will not work. All the people on the inside and folks that have been inside like Ron that are out now tell me the problems in our prisons are not caused by peeling paint or crumbling walls or anything about the buildings themselves. They're caused by the people inside, the lack of guards or the corrupt guards and the human capital. So we need to get people out of prison and we need to reform the system that we have and make it truly correctional and not just punishment and torture. I know, thank you so much for that, Beth. And I hope that's a, a sobering awakening for people mm -hmm. who have not been familiar with this. Dr. Kay, I saw you were. Yes, yeah, some years ago, I was invited to attend sentencing commission meetings. And so I was struck by a couple of things. One is the low level offenders that are incarcerated. You know, they will send low level drug offenders to, to prison. And they will also send property offenders. I mean, if you know anything about our system, typically, you know, property offenders will get, unless it's chronic, they will usually get a community-based sentence. And so I was struck by that. The second thing I was struck by was the fact that Alabama had passed truth and sentencing laws, which said that inmates going to prison, sentenced to prison, were required to serve 85% of their sentence so I raised questions about that. And I asked, I said, so you, there's already a problem with overcrowding and you are passing a law that says that individuals must spend 85% of their sentence incarcerated. Uh, you know, that again, that's one of those troubling things to me. Uh, mentioning uh, rehabilitation programs, that's a major problem, not just in Alabama prisons, but in most prisons. You know, there's a lack of rehabilitation programs that really prepare individuals to re-enter the society. Uh, and I tell my students all the time, you know, don't ever say, put them in prison and throw away the key. That's not intelligent. But what we understand and what we know that 95% of the people who go to prison will ultimately get out. And we need to prepare them to come back and be reintegrated into our communities. And our prison systems just don't do a good job of rehabilitation. And yes, it is an individual decision that a person wants to be uh, rehabilitated. I had a student who made a decision uh, that I, want, I don't wanna live this life anymore. I've been in prison too long. Uh, he stepped out of prison, enrolled at UAB, got a degree in social work, went to UA, got a master's in social work, and took a job with Community Corrections of America. Yes, he made that decision, but we've got to put in place conditions and programs that are conducive to individuals wanting to uh, be rehabilitated. And so when they get out, they can come out and they can reintegrate. And I don't mean disintegrative shaming. Mm -hmm. I mean, reintegrate back into society and be successful and productive. And so we've got we've to do some rehabilitating for ourselves too in society as well. So I, I just wanted to add that as she talked about, you know, the lack of rehabilitation programs. Oh, thank you so much. And before my next question, if you have any questions, please raise your hand and we'll get a mic to you because we're going to get to that part of the program very shortly. But Ron, piggybacking off what Dr. K said, um, can you talk about the necessity of having educational programs within the prison system? Um. Is very much needed. In fact, I wouldn't be sitting here if it wasn't for education. That's what really brought my brought <laughs> your attention to me. That's how I met Bell, um, prison professor, um, concerning um, some classes, uh, UAB taught classes, and I was just happened to be one of the guys that happened to just went to a lot of them, and I got lucky to be chosen by the warden to be interviewed, and to be interviewed again, you know? <laughs> but um, you will go crazy in prison if you don't have nothing to do. At least to be honest, I would have went crazy if I didn't have anything to do. Um, I can remember um, almost well, over a decade, I probably went without even receiving a visit from my family. Uh, and those classes was like people coming to see me. And every time they came, they were always talking about something I was interested in. 
when I first got to prison, I was I really, I was waiting to be sentenced. In the county jail, I took my uh, GED test. After I was sentenced, I found that I got my GED. And one of the main motivating forces that moved me to keep taking classes was how my grandmother was so proud when she, when I called home, was just telling me how proud she was of me. She was just going like, and I never heard her said this in a while because she's the only individual that I really disappointed, that I felt that I really disappointed, that I cared about disappointing. And here is tell me that she was proud of me for something. I'm like, wow, yeah, but I'm like, okay, what I do? And she told me, I, you know, you got your GED. I'm like, oh, I did, yeah. You know, I took that thing. And then uh, from then on, I went and got my barber certificate, a commercial food certificate. But then they stopped me from taking trades because I would took some more. And so I had to just start taking other classes. But at first I was doing it for her. But then the classroom became my like my sanctuary, my getaway. Um, I can get in the classroom and the instructors will come and treat me like a human being. When I go through day after day of being treated like, I won't say an um, animal was so much close to it. But uh, when I go in these classrooms, you had these instructors come and look in your eyes and they'll see things and they encourage things and bring things at you. Um, I wouldn't have anything hanging in that art museum right now if it wasn't for those people coming and bringing the things out of me, these potentials I didn't know I had. And it got to the point that so many was coming out that I was realizing that I could do this and do this, that I got angry because I felt I was wasting it. But then a friend of mine, Hassani Jennings, He's the type of person like, well, hey, no, you ain't got to waste it. So we started creating classes. We created a, a debate class. It was an honor dorm. And uh, we, we started a debate class. And a student asked me today, well, well, they just let you do it. You couldn't have to do it. I'm like, well, they couldn't stop us. <laughs> you know, If they didn't grant us that little space in the library, we would have done around our bunks because that's where we are. And so when the idea came about the debate class, okay, that's cool, let's do it. You know, I'm talking about, but how, you, how do you debate? Well, her son, he said, well, it's a book. He told me it's a book in the library. We'll get the book. We'll get the book. Okay, bam, we got the class. We start the class. Then he started a French class. And it's like, we were just hungry for knowledge. Like when COVID and other things will stop class from coming in, we create our own, you know? We, it was this, this, this book we had. Um, man, I can't think of this book where we would be up at night and study. We would create our own little courses where like, it would be like two or maybe three. And we'd get up at five in the morning just to go and study these little things, you know? And... The classroom was like for a lot of us, where we would go and just get away. And to this day, um, man, I, would, I still want to go to the classroom. I wish I can go to UAB and go to some classrooms now. <laughs> but one of, one of the most interesting classes I went to was um, Connie Kohler's class. She's sitting right there. If I had a spotlight, I swear. I swear. <laughs> but um, she came to a UAB lecture once. And she was so impressed with the guys. She said, well, I'm going to come and start a class. And so she came and started this body help, we called it. And so uh, her idea was to do a podcast. And so, you know, we guys, we signed up for body help. Oh, body, oh, well, I don't know what it is. Okay, let's sign up anyway. You know, but we didn't know we was going to get in here and start writing a podcast. Then either one of us know anything about podcasts, doing dialogue, creating characters, none of that. But this woman taught us how to do it. And before we know it, we just, I mean, creating these characters that centered around certain ailments, um, hip C, diabetes, you know, and we would show how an individual dealt with such things in prison. And we could write this because we see it every day. And even some of men that was doing it, you know. And then um, we did, we finished the season. And when we finished it, and then we put the background and all that, we was like in awe when we heard it. It was like, man, you know, so let's do another one. <laughs> you know, we've done two, but we still wait for them to get finished. But uh, that was the most rewarding classes. And in the process, um, Jefferson, Jefferson County Memorial Project. Abigail was your name, I can't, last name I can't remember. Schneider. Schneider, thank you. Um, we came to her attention. And so she came and wanted us to uh, write on, um, well, she was gonna create, uh, that's what, uh, Liberated Voices. That's what we created, Liberated Voices. And she wanted us to write on uh, mass incarceration, slavery, and lynching. And these were subjects that, you know, we talk about and stuff, but. When it comes time, when the time came for us to sit and have these discussions, the whole environment in the classroom changed because it was fun creating characters and things. But now we're talking about something that is kind of personal because we might have had maybe one white guy in the class. And so we had to start telling our stories. First, we started like just talking about our stories when we first encountered racism, first called 
a nigga and this, all this stuff. And for Connie, and I think as other, you know, we saw tears in our eyes because she didn't know this side of us. She just sees us these intelligent, fun loving guys that she's teaching, but she didn't know our experiences. And we started talking about our experience, writing about our experience, doing poems, doing art about our experience. And you can go on Liberated Voices and see a lot of it now. But one of the things about in doing that, I enjoyed it so much because I didn't know I could write, you know? And I was so eager to write that when some other guy was, you know, jiving about doing his, Connie, let me write it, you know? <laughs> and, you know, something else, she got to the point, she would say, oh, you wanna write it? I said, yeah, let me write it, you know? And we was listening to it. I'm sitting, I didn't realize it, but I'm sitting there listening to it and like, I wrote that. And then I wrote, and then I'm like, man, I wrote that. And then, but I didn't like it because I didn't like the way the guy was saying it because I wrote that, but it's like, that ain't how I want you to say it, but it's out of my hand now. But it's like, it made me feel so, man, just, it gave me back my worth, you know? And that's what these classes are do. They give you back your worth because you got people coming in treating you like a human being, drawing your potentials out and showing you how you can be productive with it and share it with other people. And it's still going on today. Uh, in fact, I saw the gentleman, my friend, he's now in another camp. He didn't have nothing to do. So he's like, I'm gonna start a nonprofit organization. And that's exactly what he's doing right now. He's got the team together and he's, I'm talking about these are the kind of minds we got in prison, but a lot of people don't know. They're just wasting in there. And because of one mistake, this one thing I love about Rob, what Ron Moore said, because the person was convicted of a robbery, I mean, a murder or a first degree robbery, that doesn't mean that he's still a murderer or a robber. If he doesn't spend 30 years and he hasn't murdered or robbed anybody, he's shown, I mean, like, why won't you let him out? But it's a friend of mine that they just denied parole who had over 30, he had 32 year clear record. 32 year clear record and they set him off five years. I know, I know you're going to talk about that in a minute, but this is what's going on. You got guys doing everything they can, taking classes, doing this to make parole. And then you go up here and they put you off, not one like they used to, not six months or maybe two, but they put you off five years. Guys are resort to go back to using drugs. Guys are resort to like, guys have actually tried to kill themselves because they don't, I mean, it's like, hey, what can I do? I'm tired of going through this pain. I'm crying out, you're not hearing me. I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. And we thinking that Montgomery don't give a damn about us. We thinking that society don't give a damn about us. I wish that I could have video all of these. I went to Montgomery with Carl. I've been in Zooms with people. And if they could hear the way people out here are talking and trying to save their life, the whole, it would, a whole, so much would change. Mm -hmm. I've been blessed to be able to get some material in there where I've talked in different places, been lucky. And whenever I talk, I'm talking about them. You know, I'm trying to point out that I'm really a small something to the pair to the guys that's in there. And when they see that, oh man, man, you know, the hope it gives them. But um, if there's any way you can figure out a do to get more classes in there, and not just classes, but to get the administration to start encouraging guys to go to classes because you will have more administration like disencouraging guys because I'll give you an example. This is church service was going to, uh, we call it youth connection because a lot of the youth in there, they was you know, doing a lot of the stabbing and hurting themselves and all of that. But then youth connection was playing gospel rap and they love rap, the beats and you know, it's, 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 it's like the church was full. They had to, they changed the amount of guys can come into that chapel just because it was a lot of youth. And those guys was, you'll see them, they're singing positive songs. There's like when these rappers like just telling them, hey, what's get in your mind? Get out to this and that. But they tried to prevent that. But really it took other officers in there, a sergeant to see that we need this and had to make them, no, don't do that. But when he's not there, they do a little thing, but when he's there, he make them know we're gonna do this. But it's hard in there for guys to really get what they need, the nourishment they need. And, um, and there's so many that don't know how to bridge these gaps between themselves and their families. Mm -hmm. Because when your family, when you've done things that turn your family against you and you don't have that support or that love, that's another wound, yeah. you know? Yeah. That's another bit of pain that you wanna numb with drugs or whatever. Yeah. So education, <laughs> 
I had to, one of my models was, I don't want to say this so many times, but that kept me going in prison is that I didn't have the luxury of being unproductive. And the reason I kept telling me that self that because I'm seeing other guys that's not being productive that are just fading away. And I'm like telling myself, I can't be like that. Mm-hmm. You know, even though I know I'm dying here, but I can't, I ain't finna die like that. Wow. You know, so yeah. that's thank about you. this. You know. No, thank you for that. I think, you know, you highlighted so many things about the importance of community and having a mm-hmm. village around you. Um, you know, one of the things I always tell people in my work that sometimes the shortest distance between two people is a story. And so thank you for being an advocate for those who can't be an advocate for themselves right now as we're having this panel. So I'm gonna take a quick pause because we're getting at our time. Do we have any questions in the audience or anyone's virtually, John? Do we have any in the audience? Okay, over here, John. The UAB has a program where um, each year faculty members, uh, different people from the university community will go into the prison systems, particularly Donaldson. I think Donaldson has been identified as a prison where they go in and and, uh, teach classes. Uh, I have been asked to do it a couple of times. I'm on schedule to do it next year. So UAB does have a program where um, faculty members, staff can go into the prisons and and Donaldson and teach classes. And there's another route the chapel, mm-hmm. contact different prisons, chaplain, and you know, give them your pitch mm-hmm. and just let them know that you're really trying to help them want to teach. And I know the chaplain right now at Donaldson, but the only thing that's interfering right now is this, you know, COVID, okay. you know, COVID, but uh, that's another route. Mm-hmm. We've, had, we've had so many classes that come through the chapel. And in fact, that's where we were teaching the classes. That's where we did all our, our uh, podcasts at, in the chapel. So contact them. Awesome. Carl, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. if you will give me your information, I'll pass it along to that office. Awesome. Mm-hmm. Carla. Yeah. I just want to make sure we don't end without an understanding that each of you in this audience and watching from Zoom can make a difference. It can seem pretty hopeless and awful as we've all described. But right now, the state of Alabama is being closely watched by the federal government. They know they need to make some changes, but the most important thing that can happen is for legislators to hear from their constituents that they are paying attention to the prison crisis. And the message needs to be, we want less incarceration. We want shorter sentences. We want more money invested in drug treatment and mental health and reentry and less money poured into these failing prisons. There are a lot of resources on Alabama Appleseed's website, alabamaappleseed.org. We have reports, we can do presentations, but Lawmakers hear too much from people who believe in more prison and they don't hear from people who understand the problems in the system. And I wanna point out there was actually good law, a big change in sentencing that passed several years ago called sentencing standards. And what that did was reduce a lot of sentences for people coming into prison. So younger people ages about 15 to 30 are now incarcerated at about half the rate they were before these sentencing standards were passed. It's a really, really good news for the state. And it means our prison population has dropped. The problem is those laws were not made retroactive for people who were thrown away in the 80s and the 90s, like Ron and thousands more. So older people are still serving those draconian sentences and older people have often aged out of criminality and are least likely to reoffend. And so we need people telling our lawmakers, we want retroactivity for the sentencing standards. We want laws and policies that will let older people out of prison. Fully 25% of the prison population is over age 50, which is terrible policy and a waste of money. One last data point is since those sentencing standards passed, and younger people started getting shorter sentences, the crime rate in Alabama has dropped almost 20% 
less prison equals less crime. The rate for robbery has dropped over 50%. And so it just goes to show that packing more people into harmful, violent prisons is not making any, any of us safer. Um, so we have reports on all of that data on our website, and I hope y'all will check it out. Awesome. And I know we're at our time, but John, do we have a virtual? T, T, we don't really have any specific questions. Lots of comments, though. So we will print a transcript of that out for the panelists. Lots of really great comments. Awesome. Um, so as we close, um, definitely thank you to our panel for being here and sharing your work, Ron, for sharing your story. Uh, we definitely honor that. Um, I want to thank you all, as well as John Fields and Christina McClellan and the AVA staff and the University of Alabama's Dr. Nicole Fleetwood and the Marking Time team and everyone in the audience that is here and virtually. We appreciate your time and attention to this important and very vital topic for our state. Um, major support for Marking Time, Art and the Age of Mass Incarceration is provided by the Art for Justice Fund, a sponsored project of Rockefeller Philanthropy Advisors, NYU Steinhardt, School of Culture, Education, and Human Development, and the Alabama State Council for the Arts. Our next Marking Time event will be Ava Movie and a Tour Night, Thursday, October 21st at 6 p.m. Join Ava staff for a tour of current exhibitions, followed by a film screening and discussion related to Ava's current exhibition, Marking Time, Art and the Age of Mass Incarceration. The tour will start at 6 p.m and register at Ava's website, uab.edu slash Ava. And before we close out 20 quick seconds, Beth, what do people need to leave here knowing? Um, I think that um, what changed for me in understanding this issue was getting to know the people that are impacted. And part of the problem with our policy is the majority of people that are writing policy are not impacted and have no proximity to people that are impacted. So being here, listening to this discussion, hearing from Ron, and then going to see this exhibit marking time will make for you prison less abstract and more real. And so I just think you take that with you. And if you feel um, like um, trying to affect change, share it with somebody else you know, tell people about it. Most of the politicians think that nobody cares about prisons. And I think what they really mean is nobody that they care about cares about prisons. So we need to let them know we all care about this because this is all happening in our name. So thank you all for being here. Absolutely. So thank you, Beth. Thank you, Ron. Thank you, Collar. Thank you, Dr. K. Thank you, Ava. Thank you, John. And thank you all for being a part of this conversation. And don't let it just end with you leaving out this door. Share this information with your friends, with your family, and with your peers. We share a lot of stuff on social media. That means absolutely nothing. Mm -hmm. And this is something that can actually impact and change. Remember, now you know Ron. So now you have somebody impacted by that system in your life. So thank you all. And you all have a good night.